Namaskar everyone. This is Nina Rao and I am so happy to be with Vasviya Nasreen who you can see on the screen with me and those of you who are listening. I hope you'll have a chance to look her up and see this beautiful being who's in front of me. I'm so happy to have you with me. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah. Um, let me just share with everyone a little bit about you. So, Wazvia Nasreen is best known for being the only Bangladeshi and first Bengali in the world to climb the seven summits. I'm going to ask you about that later, how you mention Bengali. The highest mountains of every continent are the seven summits. She is also the only woman to hold simultaneous titles of National Geographic Explorer and Adventurer. An outspoken activist since her late teens, her passion has always been driven by causes close to her heart. A human rights activist, an environmentalist, a writer, educator, pilot, and producer, Wasfia wears many hats, all of which are grounded in strong foundations of meditation and self-realization practices. And last but last not least, she's an expedition expert and takes leaders on journeys into nature to connect with self, humanity and the earth so that together we can commit to solutions that will create positive change for our planet. At the end I'm going to ask her to share with us what she's working on right now. Welcome, thank you so much Vasvias for being here with us today. Um, for all of you who are listening, I first met Wasvia virtually last year when she was a guest speaker and teacher on the Dalai Lama's Power of Compassion Global Vision Summit along with Tenzin Bob Thurman and a few others who were also participating at the time. So Wasvia, I just want to ask you, I looked at your Instagram page because who doesn't and <laughs> I was just like, I, I have to keep posting. I'm so bad at it. Yeah, I know. I, don't, I understand that. But at least you have a nice short bio. It says athlete, vegan, National Geographic ad adventure and explorer, made in Bangladesh, <laughs> raised in the Himalayas and based in Los Angeles. So <laughs> it sounds a lot like my life all over the world. So go ahead. <laughs> well, the Los Angeles bit is more recent. Uh, and I was born and raised in Bangladesh. You want me to give you a whole story of how that came about? or I would love to hear however you want to describe your path till you got here. And then we we'll can go into some details after. OK, awesome. Um, also, just a side note that made in Bangladesh hashtag is there because uh, of we can talk about it later, but you know, the we're number two after China now in terms of garments industry and um, I was involved with the rights of garments factory workers, yes. who are mostly women and so that made in Bangladesh title is to get people to you know pay attention to the workers condition. Um, sure. um, that's why the hashtag is used. Uh, so yes, as I was saying, I was born in Bangladesh and, um, you know, almost 40 years ago. Uh, and my parents were just middle class. My mother was a teacher and a musician and my father was uh, shipping. Um, he worked in the ship. So basically my, if anyone's familiar with that region, it's if you see the Bay of Bengal, yeah. which is the largest delta on the planet, um, there's a, you know, this the Sundarbans, the largest mangrove forest is, uh, you know, kind of sidelines the mm -hmm. Bay of Bengal. And so we were, at the time that I was born, they were living in a town very near there called Kulna. And even now in the last four decades, it's still, it looks like a village, more like a rural town um, in comparison to let's say the capital Dhaka. So um, now that I look back, it was probably, you know, I'm so grateful that I was born there because I was born into nature. You know, my dad worked in the ships in, not in the mountains, but at least 
in, in a, from a water perspective, like I was always in touch with the earth, climbing trees, you know, running around. My dad would go to the ship. Sometimes he would take us to the Indian Ocean, you know, like just having that experience from such a young age. And, you know, people even back then were just very humble to Mother Nature's wrath. And I vividly remember that because we would have the floods every single monsoon season. And, um, you know, people, so there are villagers who build their homes on a daily basis when that happens. They just go inland, inland, inland. And, um, you know, over the decades, I've seen how much resiliency is, you know, with those people who pay the worst in the climate crisis uh, equation, but they they had the least to do anything to do with climate crisis. Right. Um, that's a whole nother story. But uh, so, and then later on, my parents moved to Chittagong, which is in the southeastern part of the country, very near the Burma border. And so the Rohingya refugees in the present time are kind of in the Chittagong Hill Tracks area. Um, so that's those are the only hills we have but at, from a child's perspective those were my mountains you know and so uh, at the age of six I, I climbed something called it's funny to say now but it's like a, from a girl's little girl's perspective that was like a really high mountain for me I was only six years old and it's, it's called Chandranath Pahar there's a whole temple Chandranath uh, it's a Hindu temple above that uh, uh, little hill um, so again you know very grateful that that whole experience with nature anyone who's traveled in Bangladesh needs to leave Dhaka city because everyone thinks of Dhaka the capital as most of the country and the beauty of the region lies within those territories and then when I was about 12 um, you know my parents always had issues the earliest I can remember and we just didn't know what was going on um, and it is a very long story, uh, which I'm writing about in my memoir. So if people want details, they can uh -huh. read that book. But sh long story short, one fine day when I was 13, I woke up one day to know that my mom left. Oh. And at that time, you know, there was a lot of confusion, like my mom left. Okay, maybe she's going to come back. What happened? Nobody knows what's going on. Um, and then worse started spreading and then later on my dad got a divorce letter in the uh, mail and so my parents ended up getting divorced when I was 13 and my dad was always working he was a workaholic he didn't know how to raise us and so for a period of nine to ten months I didn't go to school she was also my teacher so she wasn't just my mother she was my school teacher she was my music teacher she was like my yoga teacher like all you know she was in our culture, as you may know, like teachers are given a totally different respect. Regardless. Like, oh, yeah. yeah. So, but even from like, I had so much respect for her, you know, sure. and she just betrayed us. Like, and so it was like a wake up call for me. And then at that time, I realized that because I was the only daughter and she was nowhere to be found, I was some how carrying her shame and people were talking. It was a huge scandal, you know, back then in such a small town of Chittagong. So I had a, uh, you know, another auntie that I really liked, her, her sister who lived in the capital. So um, I called her up, you know, back then there was no email or whatever. And so I requested her to take me in. And uh, I said that I couldn't, you know, be in the city anymore because it's, I couldn't go out anymore because everyone's talking about it and kind oh. of who, so that was the huge shift. My dad literally put me on a flight on my own uh, to go from Chittagong to Dhaka when I was 13 uh, yeah. and then moved in with my aunt's family. And then even when I came to Dhaka, I didn't have any guarantee of what school I would like. It was in the middle of the year. But even at that young age, I knew that when, at whatever cost, I really need to educate myself because, and educate myself in English, because at that time I was in a Bengali medium school. So we have two forms of education, uh -huh. so one in English, uh, which mostly, you know, the, the wealthier people can access to, but the general mode of education is in Bengali, my mother right. tongue or Bangla. Um, 
so yeah, so I shifted from Bengali medium to English medium. Um, and after, thanks to my aunt, because of her connections and a lot of running around, I was admitted to a school. And then fast forward to becoming 18 on my, you know, we don't, in South Asia, we don't really have that 18 age or a 21 age rule that you leave your family, right? But uh, I didn't, unless you get married, <laughs> unless you get married, right? right? But I'm saying like, it's not like, oh, 18, and, you just leave the house. Of and, course, uh, of course. But I knew I had to leave the house and go somewhere on my own. And so I applied all over the world um, in three different continents and money was a huge factor and this one college in atlanta georgia well decatur georgia uh, gave me a hundred percent scholarship so i borrowed the money the money from uh, an uncle and then hopped on a flight and came to good old america wow wow <laughs> what a what a contrast okay and uh, then and then my uh concept of America was New York. <laughs> then I landed in Decatur, Georgia at a time when, uh, I don't know if you know much about Dirty South or, you know, it was called Dirty South back then, but, uh, you know, in the middle of gun violence, in the middle of racism, in the middle of everything that, you know, I had never imagined. I, I thought I went from my, you know, bad situation there and came somewhere for, you know, better life. So I was, you know, obviously culture shocked and went through a lot in my first few semesters. And then I took a transfer out. Did you have any issues being um, a South Asian person? Well, yes. Um, and then I was just talking about this uh, in that Apple podcast, I'll talk about. Uh, okay. Yeah, but it, yeah, so back then there were parts of not just Atlanta, Georgia, but South in general, we would go for festivals and stuff during the weekends. There were times when I would like duck at the back of seats, like car seats. Mm. So my uh, Western friends, like white Caucasians friends would say duck uh, because yeah. there were guys sitting on uh, there in the front of their house to shoot, shoot people of color. Um, so, I mean, I knew about racism before coming, but I just didn't know it was that alive. And then, you know, I took summer classes in um, college in North Carolina and yeah. professor just gave me a D because of my color. And I took him to the deans and I, I won that case. Like I, I my grades yeah. were good because I didn't have, so there it was, and I was the only person of color in the entire huge university. Um, Really, including even blacks, black people. Oh yes, I was the only brown person. Really, any person of color. So, but not in the Atlanta one. Atlanta one was yeah. like very More diverse. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, very diverse. Yeah. And of course, like even with my professors, everyone like I'm still friends with them twenty years later now. Yeah, uh, twenty something. Um, yeah, so that's how I ended up here, <laughs> and then uh, here being LA. No, that's how I ended up in the U.S. U.S., yes. Yeah. But then I left because I, yes. I didn't want to do anything with the U.S. Um, did you ever but, come to New York? <laughs> yeah, I did. You did, good. Yeah. Uh, well, I lived in New York for six months uh, okay. later on. Uh, I love New York. Uh, Me too. So, but see, that's what I was saying, like my concept of... New I know, York. that's why I was hoping you actually got here. <laughs> So some okay, affirmation I all over us later on um, yeah and then i took a transfer uh to scotland yeah uh, because i just wanted to leave us it was uh, it was kind of like a six months period that i was doing a study abroad and then i went there and i was like there's no way i'm coming back yeah i extended it to two years from six months till agnes scott called like my college called me up and they mm -hmm. were like They're paying for you you need to come back if you want to graduate from this college so right I return after two years but mm -hmm. those two years um were the time of my life um, yeah yeah i mean scotland is magic so yeah and my um i guess because i don't know there was there's so many similarities with like tibetan world in scotland um you know somehow it worked and my first introduction to any 
Tibetan Lama was in Scotland as well, uh, Akhung Rinpoche, who, um, the late Akhung Rinpoche, who uh, managed uh, the Sami Ling and started the Sami Ling with uh, Trungpa Rinpoche. Yes. Uh, and then Trungpa was sent to the US to open Naropa. Yes. Uh, yeah. So, yeah, it's all, I, I believe Sami Ling in Scotland is the first Western Tibetan Buddhist center. Um, mm -hmm. Before it came to America, it was there. Yeah. So I just accidentally ended up there uh, through an adventure, um, which is another whole story. And, and then I came back to Atlanta. And then, um, do you want me to continue after this? Or you can go ahead. <laughs> go ahead. So in, while I was doing my final year, I got a grant to go to India to study yeah. how women were using art as therapy. And in that trip, um, you know, I went to so many different locations, like I think 15 or 16 different locations studying because I was double majoring on in phys, uh, psychology and studio art. Uh -huh. So I was looking at different ways women were adopting to um, healing, you know, and I knew I wanted to do, like I was already into yoga, I was into healing arts and I was studying psychology and it fascinated me and, but I wanted to combine arts too. And before I was a theater student, so I wanted to use all formats of art to, for empowerment for women. Uh -huh. So on this journey, the last, and I didn't know where I was going till I got there and the last spot um, for that research was in Dharamsala, which is the um, in northern India and it's the seat of the exiled Tibetan people. At that time, I didn't know. Um, and then, yeah, I ended up with, you know, these amazing group of women who were basically, I'm like barely 21 at this age, right, yeah. at this time. And I grew up in um having no role models a no father mother or like having any kind of positive positive ways to like in my culture you take revenge you don't forgive that's the kind of uh, mm -hmm. culture i grew up in and then i end up with this group of women who were physically you know they were in chinese prison uh, for a long time and then they were, you know, somehow they managed to get out and then they walked barefoot or with minimum basic over the Himalayas and came to Dharamsala. A number of them had their bodies mutilated, like they were sterilized. Uh, you know, Chinese government had a whole program in the 80s, I believe, uh, where they sterilized Tibetan women. So right. that to end the to and end then, the Tibetan population. Yeah. Yes. Just like Native Americans, you know, and so so these women who have not, you know, from the outside, you would think they don't have anything, but they were literally like glowing the biggest smile and compassion. And they were praying for the, you know, the people who's hurt them. They're praying for Chinese people. They're uh, praying for uh, prison guards. And it was such a new concept for me. It was like a wake up call and a slap on my face. Like you thought you had it wrong. Like I was, I still remember crying the whole time because sure. it was so, so awakening for me. And then I left, you know, and on that bus trip, anyone who's been to Dharamsala uh, knows that long <laughs> that bus trip. And then the plane ride back from Delhi to Atlanta, I was like, either I just knew I had to get back somehow. At, mm -hmm. Um, How long did you stay there when you were in Dharamsala? The whole trip was about a couple of months. So mm. I, it was just very short. few days. It was short, but, you know, even in that, my dean, the dean of my, um, my one of my professors and my dean was there too. And they, they told me in that bus ride back, like, I have never seen you this alive and in your elements mm. like this. Um, and so anyway, so the timeline was when I was going to come back, to Atlanta and then moved to San Francisco, join Amnesty International at a work permit at a time when very few international, this is post 9-11. You know, so let me just fill in some blanks here for one second, because I know you've done a, a lot in your short, <laughs> short-ish life. So um, seems like you were always very interested in helping women in your activism from a young age. And you even looked at your art therapy in a way that would be helpful for women correct in India this is how you were approaching it is that what how it took you to those yeah, but I don't 
think at that time I was so consciously doing it. Mm. Um, I think I was just drawn to doing it. Yeah. Um, also, you know, I come from, a, I think my, you know, I wouldn't say my mother suffered, but my mother, her sisters, they're a generation where every one of them were married off as teenagers, right. every one of them. So, uh, culturally have, that was the norm, right? For the, I have an aunt teenager. who's married at 13 before yes. she got her period. So sure. just that, you know, just growing up in that yeah. society family and they're educated. It's not like they're from the village, uh, mm-hmm. uneducated, they're educated bunch, you know, kind of, um, but they're still, and my mother is a teacher. So I think I was just, I don't know. It's just, I wasn't like, oh, I want to be a women's rights activist or anything no. like that. I was just somehow drawn to it um, okay. at that time. Yeah. Yeah. Go ahead. Okay. So then you came back to Atlanta. And then I just the international. Have, huh? Yeah. I'm but I was, international. Yeah. The timeline was that I was going to move to San Francisco. Mm-hmm. But then on that flight back, I decided that hell with us <laughs> really <laughs> i'm going because i had a work permit so i had all these like formalities to do to claim it so i couldn't just not work and leave or whatever i had to go back to bangladesh get my work permit in they would cancel it so i came to atlanta i had a yard sale uh enough money to buy ticket to that side of the world and all my professors came and supported me they uh-huh. bought everything, like Nirvana posters that they did, <laughs> <laughs> things like that. And I had enough money to go back. And I had to take another flight from Dharamsala actually to Bangladesh to go declare my, withdraw my work permit. But that happened later. But so, yeah, th- that to say that I moved there, not knowing what was going to happen or anything, any guarantee of jobs or I didn't even know who the Dalai Lama was, to be very frank, at that time. Mm-hmm. Um, but you knew you had to be in Dharamsala. Yeah. Yeah. So I went back. Uh, and then by, it was just uh, written that I would get a job. Within a few weeks, I was sorted. Uh, I ended up staying there for seven years. Uh, just, <laughs> oh, and, you know, as a Bangladeshi, I'm, I'm also, uh, we South Asian uh, have, problem traveling unfortunately except for Nepal so in India like I was always watched by uh, intelligence I got into a lot of trouble with Indian intelligence oh my goodness okay because they they couldn't figure out why a Bangladeshi woman is working in the Tibetan cause right by Kashmir and so they Mm -hmm. thought for a second that I was a spy Mm -hmm. Uh, and thanks to you know, some of my teachers' offices and stuff. People had to really intervene to protect me up there. But so, yeah, so that's how I ended up in Dharamsala and uh, my life. What type of work were you doing when you when you first started? When I first went, uh, I was working as a special correspondent for Payul, which uh, is, it means motherland in uh, Tibetan, and it's the largest uh, Tibetan English news archive. Mm. And it covers both inside and outside Tibet but everything Mm -hmm. is Tibet. Um, So being a special correspondent also meant, you know, covering the most um, important person in town. Uh, So I didn't know that. Most important person in the world. (laughs) (laughs) In the world. And so, you know, it just, everything just lined up. And then I ended up working for four, five different nonprofits. to do with human rights and um, environmental rights, women's rights, all in the Tibetan world. But mm-hmm. I was just freelancing the whole time while I was there. And um, yeah, but on a more personal level, what it wasn't the work necessarily that was keeping me, but I myself personally, like I just said, like I didn't have any role models growing up. And then yeah. somehow I manifested the, you know, the most, the greatest role model I could have ever asked for, you know, His Holiness the Dalai Lama. I was waking up every day to just cover him. And, you know, that was my job. So tell us how your meeting was when, when you first met him. Well, I didn't meet him till 
So when I was uh, working as a journalist, mm -hmm. you, have you been to the Hamsala? No, I haven't. I haven't oh my yet. God. Yes. No, but you've seen pictures of his courtyard. Yes. So that's where he gives the public teachings, right? Yes. And so, uh, and those are for free for everyone to attend. And, you know, he would come sit uh, and there's so much security around him always. So when I first started out as a journalist, like I, we would be in the journalist section, which is mm. like kind of on the side. And His Holiness would always notice me and call me or like just, you know, tap on the head or just, he always said hi. I think because, and I remember there were my Tibetan journalist friend, they would always push me. So, and they would have the camera right behind me so that when His Holiness looked at me, they would grab that photo. And yeah. so that's how we first, you know, that was more like a darshan. Yes. We never, like, he never asked me where I was from or yeah. anything like that. But then one fine day I got a call uh, and it was like very early in the morning. I was getting ready to go to work uh, and I lived in Upper Dharamsala, which is like kind of far off from His Holiness's temple. And so it's like, uh, Miss Nazreen, uh, I was like, yes, no one calls me Nazreen like with my last name. So I, I knew it was like an official call. I was like, oh, would you like to, uh, we heard that you were interested to meet his holiness would you like to meet him uh, would you still be up for meeting him i was said this must be a joke because right. <laughs> <laughs> some friend is probably like prank calling prank him. yeah <laughs> <laughs> and i just said yes i would love to meet him and he said oh well can you come by 7:30 or 8 like some ridiculous hour and i was like and look at the watch it's like only 15 or half an hour to go and i said right. right now you mean yeah. right now okay because for me to go from where i was to, mm -hmm. so i just hung up the phone and i was like trying to look for my sari uh, it was like pouring raining i remember that and we called my sexy guy babu <laughs> <laughs> Came. he took me to the temple and I went all wet like that was my first meeting and then when I went um, his holiness is so sharp if it's eight o'clock he arrives at 7 59 like he's always very sharp on time mm -hmm, and, mm -hmm. and I was a couple of minutes late and I went in and I was just very nervous and I was totally unprepared because I it was like right on the spot kind of meeting that that was the, the first one and I think obviously his holiness could tell that i was nervous so he was cracking jokes in the beginning to kind of and he always does that to i've observed it over the years he does it to get people to I, i don't know what what his intention but for to me it looks like he does it to make people feel comfortable sure um and everyone gets so like uh well you can and so yeah so that was my first meeting but it was him on the first meeting who told me the first thing he said was you are from atisha's land and i had no clue what he was talking about yeah the atisha is uh, the ma in you know in text he's referred as an indian mahasiddha because back then bangladesh pakistan and we're what one. is now india we were all one right sure. so all the mahasiddhas in the history textbooks are written as india but if you trace back where Atisha came from, it's actually from what is present day Bangladesh. Bangladesh yeah. And he's literally one and a half hours from where I live in Dhaka. And so Atish Dimpakar was instrumental in, you know, reviving, reforming Tibetan Buddhism. And mm -hmm. his last few years was very um, in Lhasa and very near the Patala Palace. Uh, there is I've not visited it, but or haven't the chance to. But uh, I hear that his relics and a lot of, um, uh, you know, the last years of his life are still there in a little temple very near the Patala Palace. So mm -hmm. he's revered as, you know, as the Mahasiddha. And so that's what Holiness was referring to. Um, yeah. And then from there, we grew a friendship. And, um, you know, I would, and I, I am fully aware that so many Tibetans don't have access to him and so many Tibetans are still in line um, and not just Tibetans, non-Tibetans to meet him. So I, of course, don't take it for granted. Uh, I would only go when it's absolutely necessary to talk You could to him. seek counsel from him and talk to yeah. him, ask him questions. Yeah. 
That's great. And uh, yeah, and he was instrumental in you know me climbing mountains, including Everest, and um, so he's always been a guide like that. In and I feel like if he didn't come into my life or I hadn't gone there to find him. Um, I would probably not be where I am here today for mm -hmm. sure. Um, he totally changed my life as cliched as it sounds because the amount, like I was saying, the type of healing that I got, especially from my parents' abandonment yes. um, and just like, you know, growing up as an orphan with your parents alive, few minutes, but they didn't care. Uh, you know, just healing from all those wounds. It was, I give all that credit to his holiness for sure. Mm. Were you able to share all this with him at that time? Sort whenever expressly. I, no, whenever I would say, Holiness, do you remember you said this? He he doesn't like he <laughs> he doesn't take credit and you know he, he's he advises so many people. Sure. He doesn't but... remember probably like what he said to someone and you know I don't bother with him, but he knows that um I mean, he can see through everything, you know, he sees my, he's seen me grow up from the little girl that she, he met. I was a very like young mind. And so, um, yeah, um, maybe when I write it in my book, I'll give it to him. Yeah. <laughs> that way he can, yeah, I, I try not to waste as, you know, uh, that much time talking to him because he's so busy. I can understand that. I mean, when you're with beings like this, you know, they can almost assess just th through the air, you know, what's happening with you and they can say just the thing that you need to hear, even if you don't ask explicitly what it is that you need to know. Yeah. And then, uh, you know, when I was really heavily involved with Tibet work and free Tibet movement and all that, one time when we were having a private audience, his Holiness just told me that you are to lead the women of Bangladesh. What are you doing here? Like he, he was basically, and I was like, what? No, I'm going to free Tibet. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. He's like, no. And then it turned out that these intelligence people, Indian intelligence came out and I had to go back to move back to Bangladesh. Mm. Uh, in a matter of time. And then, you know, I am where I am in, in terms of my career with women's work. And so His Holiness saw that in my early twenties, way before I even, you know, could consciously think of it. And I was quite against it, actually. I was rebelling against. You I didn't think want to go back. The, that's the beauty of him is like, he, he is open to you challenging him. And he told me so many times, you can question me on anything. Like, yeah. don't just take it, take a book by the cover, question. Um, so I really, really value that, in a, especially in a spiritual teacher. For where, sure. So yeah. I've heard him say that often, like question the teachings always. Don't, don't just take it at face value, yeah. you know, really understand it. That's the best way to understand. Okay, and it was at the time also when you uh, met um, His Holiness Karmapa, also at that time? A uh, little after that. Mm -hmm. I was very uh, involved with the Tibetan work. Um, so His Holiness Karmapa was very, a young boy at that time. Um, yeah. You know, there was kind of like a, like he came as a young boy. So I knew of him who lived in Lower Dharamsala, but I was so involved and I have had you know, friends, and I can say this because I've said it to his Holiness Karmapa personally, so I know that he wouldn't mind. You know, several of the times when my friends were like, you need to go meet Karmapa. I was like, no, I'm, I, I have, I'm busy with his Holiness over here. You know, you can go <laughs> see that little boy down there. Look at your choices, yes. But it was literally like, just, I wasn't ready. You know, I had karmic um, uh, stuff to clear and then, the first day that I met him, uh, it was one of those group audiences, you know, they open up and it's like, just like sheep walk by, like yeah. you just walk by and just get flabbergasted yeah. and all, oh my God, holiness. And then boop, someone just takes right. you out, you know, right. so you barely don't. But as I entered the room, I felt like there was a CCTV watching me from every angle and from wherever I looked, I felt like he was looking at looking me at you. Mm. and 
I know many people feels like that with him. And it's like, it doesn't matter how many hundreds of people there are, Karma is watching you. Yeah. Um, and so I go to the, you know, go through the line, go to the front and his assistant, who's a very good friend of mine now, he's not his assistant anymore. He was translating. So this is still when he wouldn't, uh, you know, he had, I forget how many years it had been, but he his English wasn't, um, he was Quite still fluent. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I think I said, Tashidile, and he said, Tashidile, and said something I didn't understand. And I looked at the translator and he said, ancestors. And I was like, okay. And then someone just shoved me off and I moved out and I was like, what does that mean? <laughs> right. What does that mean? Ancestors. And then later I went back uh, to meet him personally. And so alongside Atisha, there's another teacher called Tilopa, mm -hmm. uh, who is the founding, one of the founding fathers of the Kagyu lineage in Tibetan. Sure. Mm -hmm. I didn't know he was from my village. What? In Bang in well, the hometown that I grew up in. Near family. the Sundarbans, that that oh, in Chittagong. So Chittagong. in the text you will see it as Chattivaho. Okay. Back then it was called Chattivaho. Okay. And so he was referring to that. And uh, I was like, wait, what? Who? Tilopa? I, I, you know, I didn't even, this was just all this new world opening up. Right. And then I went back, I, you know, researched. Uh, very few people know about Tilopa in this days. Til means uh, sesame. Sesame seed and yeah. Tilopa, yeah. So that was my first meeting. But then, you know, over the years, we got very close and, I think it was also at a time when, I mean, His Holiness come up and myself were kind of the same age range, uh, you know, from from him there to moving in, you know, he had such a lockdown on him for years because uh, of the political mess that, you know, China and India are always in. And then him coming out in the West. So I have had the good fortune to follow him and document everything, you know, in his first U.S. tour in this um, life. And Were you there with him that yeah, time? Yeah, that was in New York. Yeah, to yeah the, I, I went to see him at that time. That was yeah. at the um, Waldorf Astoria. Yes. It was many different places. Places, but, but that was one of them. That was the first time I, I saw him was there. Yeah. yeah. So you remember, like, he was still like a boy. And he was. He was He was talking about Starbucks coffee. And yeah. I remember a few things like that. But I had the feeling that he walked, when he walked in the room, that I knew him. Yeah. That was my experience with him. And, um, you know, later on, I had many dreams. You know, these beings, I really don't understand how they work, but they're connected and we're connected. And if we can just recognize that, there's so much we can benefit from. Yeah. So that um, takes me to um, the place you were. So you were in the hills in Dharamsala. Is that when you started thinking about climbing? How did you get into this mode of climbing? So... <laughs> So I actually never had an intention to be a climber. Uh, so when I was working in the human rights field, I was traveling, even though I was based in Dharamsala, I was traveling a lot. And if you look at the whole Himalayan range from satellite, it's like all over, you know, from Nepal, Bhutan, like that whole range. So I was traveling a lot to Nepal, all over actually India, um, Bhutan and just working with Tibetans both sides of the mountain I still had access to Tibet uh, I haven't I, go, I got banned in 2007 uh, so, so since then I couldn't I mm. haven't been able to go back but mm -hmm. before that I could I see so a lot of my colleagues uh happened to be mountaineers and so we picked I picked up mountaineering from just being bored over the weekend um, and you know when we were in Nepal it's very easy to climb I mean easy logistics wise uh, the 5,000 and 6,000 meter peaks there so for someone who doesn't know much about mountaineering 8,000 it's kind of like a sorority club like Everest is 8,848 meters so that's an 8,000er and so but you don't 
just go there, you climb a 5,000 or first, then you climb a 6,000 or first, then 7,000, and then you become an 8,000 or if you go the proper way. So even 5,000, 6,000 meters are roughly like something between 17 to 22 feet, uh, sure. 22,000 feet. Sure. And so, so my Sherpa friends who are the inhabitants of the local inhabitants of the Everest region, originally Sherpa actually means uh, coming from the East and they came from Tibet. So their dialect, their uh, religion, their culture is very similar to the Tibetan culture. Mm -hmm. It's just different. Um, the language is same, the dialect is different. So um, it's how, you know, Tibetans from different regions of Tibet has different accent kind of sure. like that but they revered of course you know um his holiness dalai lama is their god and all that you know they followed tibetan buddhism so i was all i always felt very i just remember like from the earliest even before i had confidence in my own skills i always felt like I found myself in the Himalayas and I had so much confidence climbing these mountains. Mm -hmm. um, so my it was my Sherpa friends who were like, oh, you do so well, knock on woods, uh, mm -hmm. on, uh, you know, 5,000, 6,000 meters, you should just, like, you acclimatize very well. Yeah. You should push yourself to go up uh, further. Um, and that's, that's how it began. And, you know, it's interesting to see, like, a lot of the big mountaineers, if you follow their career, yeah. they usually end up in the Himalayas at the end. Last, yes. I, by default, started there. So, um, and then went to other re mountain regions. So I got very lucky again. Um, <laughs> well, you did the work. I mean, it's climbing a mountain, people train for years, uh, you know, before that they, they can do that. I mean, I know you were practicing yoga and, you know, yeah, you were already I, living. Mm -hmm. You know, as one thing that my teacher, another teacher of mine, Kyabjitilko uh, Kinsir Yangtze Rinpoche, he always says that whatever you are in this life, don't think you just became this in this life. Correct. It, it's many, many, many years of your past life karma. So, uh, I feel like even when I fly, like my teachers tell me that you're a pro, like I knew how to fly even before I got my first class on flying. So there are some things that I think, uh, like as a child, I would get nightmares of being lost in sea. Mm -hmm. And I would always think that uh, it was my dad's shipping or whatever, because we're in the water. But now I know, like, I was definitely an adventure in past life, like, in, of whatever format that was in several of my past lives. And um, if you keep me locked in a house, I would not survive. Her. I was just telling you before this recording yeah. that you know, being yeah. stuck in the pandemic really messed up my psyche. Like, yeah, I have to, I'm a nomad. I have to travel all the time. Explorer. Explorer. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> explorer of all kinds though yeah. not just the outward exploration but also inward and this is what i wanted to ask you about can i just share something with you yeah sure so this is something that i came across um a while ago when i was reading a book by roshi joan halifax called the fruitful darkness mm. and it struck me all those years ago that i read it and when i came across your writings, I went back and I found this little bit. And I wanted to just read it to you so you can share with me also your experience, your inner experience of climbing. Mountains have long been a geography for pilgrimage, places where peoples have been humbled and strengthened. They are symbols of the sacred center. Many have traveled to them in order to find the concentrated energy of earth and to realize the strength of unimpeded space. Viewing a mountain at distance or walking around its body, we can see its shape, know its profile, survey its surrounds. The closer you come to the mountain, the more it disappears. The mountain begins to lose its shape as you near it, its body begins to spread out over the landscape, losing itself to itself. 
On climbing the mountain, the mountain continues to vanish. It vanishes in the detail of each step. Its crown is buried in space. Its body is buried in the breath. On reaching the mountain summit, we can ask, what has been attained? The top of the mountain? Big view? But the mountain has already disappeared. Going down the mountain, we can ask, what has been attained? Going down the mountain, the more the mountain disappears. The closer we are to the mountain, the more the mountain is realized. Mountain's realization comes through the details of the breath. Mountain appears in each step. Mountain then lives inside our bones, inside our heart drum. <clears throat> it stands there like a huge mother in the atmosphere of our minds. Mountain draws ancestors together in the form of clouds. Heaven, earth and human meet in the reigning of the past. Heaven, earth and human meet in the winds of the future. Mother Mountain is a birth gate that joins the above and below. She is a prayer house. She is a mountain. Wow. Beautiful. And um, I, I really, you know, I read some of the pieces that you wrote on your website when you've been up different summits. I think you wrote them a long time ago. You probably don't even remember. <laughs> I'm sure you do, actually. Um, and I just, I wanted you to just help us understand, other than the physical preparation that you must have to make in order to climb, what, what is it like for you to prepare to climb? And then as you take each step, what kind, how do you experience this journey for yourself? Mm. So for big mountains, it's, I mean, where do I even start? To me, I feel like the mental preparation is 90% of it, really, mm -hmm. because, um, you know, you can be physically so fit, but there are going to be, no matter how much you prepare, 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 the mountains are going to throw you with completely unpredictable things. And I think that's the mountaineer mindset is like, be ready to adopt on a daily basis and no matter what gets thrown not just a daily life but on a fraction of a second things yeah. are gonna go accord not according to plan and so um and i mean it like it could be negative or positive you don't know how it's gonna be so i think i for me personally i've always done a lot of prayers and you know like mm -hmm pujas and really invoke like for example Everest that's uh, I want to talk about that region because that region is not just a climbing or a scenic part of Nepal it's also spiritually speaking that uh, region is called Kumbhu uh, in Nepali and Kumbhu is uh, in Tibetan it's Guru Rinpoche's Bayu uh, B E Y U L. I think I won't do justice if I try to explain it, but they these are Guru Rinpoche's secret abodes that he had, um, you know, kept as precious. And so when you enter Kumbhu region, you see uh, it doesn't give the spiritual history of it, but it gives a sign to not kill, not lie, not harm anyone, not. Um, you know, even the chicken or whatever you eat up there is has been flown on a heli from Kathmandu or somewhere else, uh, or have been on a back of different, you know, yaks or donkeys, and that's how it's coming. There's no killing allowed. And you'll see people, the locals, constantly praying to every form of nature, whether that's a lake, whether mm -hmm. there are invisible, you know, serpents nagas as we call them um yeah. lords under the frozen lake so this was my introduction to mountaineering i didn't learn um so-called western way or any you know the professional how professionals learn i learned it directly from the tibetan and the sherpa people and i think it's very important to 
give that difference that when you approach a mountain as a pilgrimage versus when you approach a mountain with the idea in your mind to conquer her because yes. realistically speaking we never as human beings can con conquer any part of nature but that's what the colonial mentality has taught us to believe and that's how to be very frank you know the history of mountaineering is colonial you know that's how it started right but Everest itself is also a white dude's name, you know, Chomulungma, which is the local name, such a beautiful name. It means mother goddess of the universe. And uh, from Nepal side, it's called, uh, so that's the Tibetan name. And from Nepal side, it's called Sagarmata. Uh, again, you know, uh, both feminine entities that were wiped out by these British colonizers, right? So, and uh, which I'm sorry to interrupt, but I find that interesting because you said mountaineering was started by Western. Now, I want to ask you the Sherpas, right? because they've climbed these mountains and never spoken about, they must have scaled the mountain before the Westerners came. Yes. So when uh, Tenzing Norgay and Edmund yeah. Hillary climbed Everest, the successful Everest summit, right? Way before that, Tenzing Norge led four other expeditions to the top, mm -hmm. but they couldn't reach all the way to the top. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. They made it up to fourth camp, right? So, but that's why he was such a valuable asset because he already knew how to go. Right. So till today, if you see like his uh, grandson, it's like three generations passed and they're still fighting for proper credit to Tenzing Norge. Mm -hmm. You know, like Edmund Hillary with, all the love in my heart he was such a beautiful soul he got knighted he got so many awards and he's done so much for given back you know to nepal but then think norgi never enjoyed that you know mm -hmm. he was never knighted he was never given the credit so so sherpa people of course climbed mountains but they they also approach it so for example like right now is the everest climbing season that just started april okay. every every team that goes up the uh, and you know all the westerners foreigners whatever race you maybe you are welcome to join and people join and it's led by the sherpa people it's a prayer ceremony mm -hmm. to mother chomulungma neo sanglangma is the goddess name and they make an offering and they i don't remember exactly when it was but it's hundreds and hundreds of years old script that's addressed to chomulungma mm -hmm. and um you know, it, it asks for forgiveness. It asks for like even the inanimate objects like your boots and your uh, crampons and your ice sacks. You bring everything that you're going to take on her. Mm -hmm. Ask for forgiveness from that and wish for her to make a safe passage. Mm -hmm. And that's how they approach that mountain. I've had shepherd friends who, who has done that. And then, you know, somewhere up, the camps got a vision that Chomulungma telling her to telling him to come down and he did and and I've been seeing this for over two decades decades now like the difference of how uh, I, I, I hate to like differentiate like western eastern like yes. that but it's not like that it's, I'm just like even if you look at Native Americans how they approach traditionally Native, yeah traditionally yeah. the yeah. indigenous way right I think it's so much more reverence and so much more beautiful to appreciate and respect those. And I say that because I see many climbers come in and not respect those values, probably out of ignorance, but also I think uh, the mainstream media hasn't portrayed those stories well enough for people to know. I totally, uh, backtrack from where whatever you had asked me but this was to give a reference to how my beginning you know my humble beginning in mountaineering started so um when you were asking me about training to me it's all very mental there were moments when we were you know not just in everest and in so many parts of the world when we were you know stuck in storms uh there no way we were going to reach the summit and I would just sit and visualize and do all my prayers and mentally, you know, people have just died and I'm still, I had to be strong, you know, and. Uh, and can I ask you, could you yeah. activate like at that, you know, often when we do practices, we want to do these practices every day, 
regardless of what's going on. So we build the strength of the foundation of our practice so that when the time comes, you know, it starts, it, it starts working for you. Were you able to actually employ your practices in those moments where you felt distress or uncertainty of what, whatever you needed to be deciding about at that moment? Yeah, I think, um, you know, one of the things, again, my root guru, uh, Kinsey Young, she always tells me or told me before uh, when I was younger that your practice is not just your sitting practice. Every every breath is your practice. So habituating, like, whether it's a mantra that you recite or anything, whatever it may be your practice to do it on a daily, not just when we're sitting on the cushion. Yeah. And so, yeah, to to answer your question, it, it readily comes up. And I think the beginning of it is way before, like if I'm planning for an expedition in June, mentally the preparation has started in January or whenever, you know, as soon as I know I'm prepping, prepping, prepping. Yeah. So that when that time comes and I have to take a decision in a fraction of a second, I'm able to take that decision. You have oh, the clarity. The clarity. And, yeah. you know, if I'm with a team, whether whether it's the good of the whole team mm -hmm. or it's a very ego approach, you know, for my solo benefit, you know, to just differentiate because things like that happen up there, you know, like uh, there, are, there has been moments when I've been close to like the summit, like maybe 900 meters close and I had to come back to rescue someone, you know, and I had, I had so many months of fundraising and so much effort to go into the mountain, but I knew that that was the right thing to do. So being able to take those decisions and, um, when I'm organizing expeditions too, and not just for big mountains, like I just got back from Everest base camp this February. It was like winter minus 38, like those bones. Oh um, it's my 61st time this time. And I was walking, you know, this is the same path. Wait, did you just say your 61st time? Yeah. <laughs> that seems almost impossible. <laughs> Girl, I'm 40. I have been doing this for the last two decades. So Yeah. So would you, did, did you start that, climbing in your early 20s? That's when you started making your way up? Uh, well, in Everest Base Camp, yeah. yes. So, yeah. so Everest Base Camp is uh, 18, about 18,000 feet. And mm -hmm. then the summit is 29,029. Yeah. So, uh, but I've been in that whole region uh, at that altitude for long time um yeah. well what was i gonna say oh so when i was walking this time in uh february 2022 and this was my first international trip after the pandemic two and a half years stuck in us no complaints uh but when i walked i remembered wow i walked like i know every single turn you know it's just like this is a mm. trail that i know i can eyes closed just go you know and i know which lodge is where i know which sherpa family is there this is my like neighborhood kind of a thing like my hometown but i realized that my mind was completely in a totally free state and because I had a lot of trauma growing up, you know, there was in my 20s and even in my 30s, to be very frank, till I got to LA, uh, like I didn't have the right support to, wow. you know, address those traumas. And also when I was in balance, it's very hard to do that kind of healing work when you're a public personality and you have so much responsibility. So, uh, so I was walking the same path, but my mind was in a totally different place and, mm -hmm. um, and I, I totally lost what how... we were just talking about mental preparation for yeah. climbing. Yeah, that's how we started with this. Um, and then you said you were up at base camp, Everest Base Camp for the 61st time. And then I was shocked. <laughs> also 61st time because I led so many expeditions yeah. because I was uh, doing that for a living for a while. I yeah. was guiding people to Everest Base Camp for a long time. Yeah. So let me just try to get a little bit of timeline here because we have seven summits and you you managed to make it to the first summit which was the highest yes uh was that kind, your of. kind of okay that was not the first summit though for okay the, yeah okay um first of the seven summits i would say 
So I know the seven summits as uh, Kilimanjaro in mm -hmm. Africa, which I've seen and I've always wished to climb and never did. In Europe, Mount Elbrus, yeah, in Russia. I'm just going to say this for people yeah. who would be curious because I was curious. Uh, North America, Denali. Uh -huh. And South America, Mount Aconcagua. Can you pronounce it for me? Aconcagua. Acon Aconcagua. Aconcagua, right. I read about this, what you wrote, that was very beautiful when you did that climb. Um, and in Asia, Tomolungma, like we just talked about, Sagar Mata. I love that. I didn't know that it was called Sagar Mata. And I also loved what you said in another talk that I heard of yours, where you refer to this mountain as the third pole mm -hmm. because of the, the mass of water that's held right. by the mountain and how important it is for supplying water for everybody who lives below. Yeah, so it's not just the mountain, but the mountain gives birth to all these glaciers, right? Correct. And all of Bangladesh's major rivers. So those who may not know, Bangladesh is a river-centric country. It's crisscrossed with rivers. And all those rivers actually originate from the third pole. Mm -hmm. So we're connected through our water system. You oh. know, Our lifeline is water. Definitely. And the other is um, in Antarctica, Vincent Massif. Mm -hmm. And then Australia, Mount Kosciuszko. No, so... Not. That's, a, that, that's another list that people do because basically few Americans uh, believe that Australia is a continent. <laughs> Rest of the world believes that Australasia or Oceania. Oh, yeah. Because if Australia was a continent, then where is where does New Zealand go, and where what happens to all the islands? So the actual true seventh summit is in West Papua, Jaya Peak, uh, Karsten's Pyramid. Karsten's Pyramid. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So that was my biggest hurdle to get to, and it's the most uh, difficult of the seven, actually. Yeah, it's tall. Yeah. No, it's uh, technical, like it's, technical. Uh, mm -hmm. and to get to the region in West Papua, it's, it was like, I could write a whole book about that, that adventure. Um, whereas Kosciuszko is like a bump. Like, yeah, it seems like it's much <laughs> lower in height for sure. Yeah. So just tell me, um, we don't have to talk about each of these climbs, but over what span of years were you able to accomplish all these um, Climbs because it's a lot of work to even get there, as you were saying. Right. So then, yeah. Especially with the Bangladeshi passport. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> we, nobody recognizes us, and there's like you have to stand in line for visa. So a lot of these areas didn't even have diplomatic ties with Bangladesh at the time that I started. We had no diplomatic ties with South America. Mm. Uh, or, and I had to go to South America several times because Antarctica, you go through South America. Right for the reason that I was getting into. So, but the first five of them, including Everest, I did back to back in one and a half years. And then uh, I guess I was going too fast and I got uh, injured with the frostbite and mm -hmm. also I was bankrupted. I was taking all this bank clothes to go climb mountains. And so it, then it gave me a pause and then uh, I ended up doing Denali and Karsten's Pyramid uh, on the fourth year. So Karsten's Pyramid, um, and also mind you, in between these mountains, I was training in different locations. So yeah. for example, to go to Antarctica, I couldn't go directly from Bangladesh. I would probably have a heat, you know, or a stroke and just die going straight in. Yeah. So I went to winter Canada, because uh, when we went to Antarctica, it was summer in Southern Hemisphere, right? So I would go to, Western uh, BC and then train there for mm -hmm. a couple of weeks, acclimatize and then fly into mm -hmm. Antarctica. Mm -hmm. So just to give you an idea of the whole expenditure and the logistics of it. Um, so yeah, it took me all in all four years, but um, there was a lot of gap in between um, after the fifth one. And Denali took me three attempts. The weather, uh, mm. Denali is like an Arctic weather circle. Uh, yeah. uh, up there so when weather comes in it's very hard and then you have to wait for the next year because there's only one permit that you can get uh, oh. 
I have to wait out another year for that. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, so four years, 2011 to 15. That doesn't seem very long. Oh, wrong for me. <laughs> <laughs> it's a lot that you packed into those few years. Oh my goodness. Yeah. I love the, the idea of um, thinking about the climb as a pilgrimage, as yatra, yeah. and as a, a way to surrender as opposed to conquering. I think that that's a really beautiful way of describing because it is in fact like that, whether it's the ocean or the mountain or the desert or whatever landscape of Mother Nature we might be traversing. Mm. So, um, okay, wonderful. And um, let's talk a little bit now. Okay, let's move into your COVID, COVID era. <laughs> <laughs> when you were here and um, it seemed like it was a, it changed things for you going through um, having, getting COVID and then being laid up for a while. Oh yeah. How Absolutely. was that for you? Yeah. Um, so I got COVID in March, uh, 2020 before America actually like it, America just, just officially announced it, you know? Um, so at that time I was misdiagnosed, like not misdiagnosed. They just didn't take me. They didn't want to deal with me. So phys on a physical level, I was going through it, but, uh, it's a very long story. So I try to say it short, that whole one instant of getting infected. And then I had pneumonia and then it led to a series of my entire left side, uh, which is also in Tibetan Buddhism, Chinese medicine, um, whole, all this medicine, medical system, the left side is related to the mother. Um, and so my left kidney, my left uh, uterus, my intestine, everything was affected. So it took me a one and a half years of recovery, like full recovery. Mm -hmm. uh, so during that time, um, I probably purified almost 20 years of karma in terms of doing internal work because, mm -hmm. um, you know, at that time I didn't realize, but now that I look back is like, I'm so, so grateful for that time that I got to like expedite on processing all this wounding from really young time like that I didn't even remember in my adult life came up and so and I had good people around me to lead me to the right um, therapist or somatic healing healers um, I don't know if you know much about yes. somatic work yeah so I I didn't know about somatic work mm -hmm. for you know till recently you know two three years ago um so yeah, so to so I've been doing a lot of internal work since COVID, and you know I've always done a lot of internal work, but this was like as if it was like I, you know, even in Tibetan Buddhism, uh, sickness or illness is a chance of purification or it's a time okay. of purification, and it was as if given to me so I could process this, and then uh, like I'm writing the chapter after this and. The chapter is because I'm writing my memoir uh, right yes. now, um, and the chapter is called "My Exit Trauma Free." Uh, also, you know, it's I've always wanted to not carry the not just trauma, the shame, the cycle that my mother's lineage was carrying, mm -hmm. and I told them this is where it ends, and I'm not gonna have a baby until I know. I'm not passing that on anymore. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, so uh, that's where I'm at now. Presently, I feel, of course, we always have work to do, but I, I feel like, you know, I've really come a long way in the last two and a half years in terms of healing and really finding the right community and people who can help me heal too and vice versa. Yeah, it's great because you probably, you know, you had to stop everything else also so you really had this time to retreat and go right and, and to... then before that even though i had bases in different areas like i was constantly traveling like last 20 years have been just travel in my life and so um, i never had the time and the space to work on it um, or even look that deep in and also um 
you know, I joke because when people hear that I'm in LA, they were like, wait, what? What are you doing in LA? Why LA? But um, I, I, I always joke that LA has been my rehab. It's it's like a rehab for me, even the work is here. But, um, you know, really f- the knowledge and like when I l- look back and I was able to find a kind of like a deeper forgiveness for everything that had happened, uh, whether because my mother didn't know, um, you know, she was raised by another, my grandma who didn't know, you know, like she, they were just, they were, they did the best with what they had exactly. at that time. So, yeah. It so takes a of, lot though, to release that anger, you know, yeah. it takes a lot to release that anger and to forgiveness and not blaming. And also just like all my life, I've kind of, because I was, uh, I was, I was the caretaker in the family yeah. household, right? So uh, the peacemaker. So in my life too, professionally speaking or whatever, I would attract people who I rescue, right? So that became my pattern. <laughs> oh. uh, so in the last two and a half years, I also kind of, I literally like one day I started writing down every single person yeah. that I catered to or had any kind of codependent relationship dynamics. And then once I started doing the work, as cliched as it gonna sound, every one of them kind of disappeared. Fell away. Yeah. Fell away. Some of them came back. And then once I made my boundaries, you know, it's just, and now I have a totally different set of, you know, I re kind of repatterned my, mm-hmm. and even those people, if they're in my life, they know where my, my uh, boundary lies. Boundaries, yeah. That's such a big part of learning. I, sure. I don't overgive anymore because yeah. my, my body, like I had so much of it in my body, like carrying other people's shit. Yeah. <laughs> But, you know, also as an activist, um, because you do, this is very much a part of your, your being, your personality is, is caring for those who need help. Right. So, you know, you've talked about um, uh, wanting to be inspiration for young girls, um, for children. You're writing a series of kids books as well, right? Yeah, and then we just recently, uh, I don't know if you've seen that, the National Geographic uh, Children's Book, that's for, with 24 of my female explorers. Uh, so it's like 25 women explorers and adventures around the world. And that's that's a children's book. Uh, we just released in February, I think. Yeah. I haven't seen it. I saw, I saw it on your website that it had come out. Yeah. yeah. And... Um, you know, one of the things that you also mentioned was um, about your activism and how the foundation of it would be nonviolent, no matter what um, road you were taking to help people. So just share a little bit with me about who are the peoples, when you went back to Bangladesh and you talk about, for example, like when we talked about Made in Bangladesh in the beginning, and you felt like you wanted to shine a light on the predicament of of certain groups of people in your country. Tell me a little bit more about that. Yeah, so when I moved back to Bangladesh from Dharamsala, um, I worked with several nonprofits again, because Bangladesh is um, in the development sector, it's known as a, you know, the successful pit kind of like every, there are all these success stories in Bangladesh and there's all these really large nonprofits working there. Uh, BRAC is the world's largest nonprofit, so I worked for them, I worked for CARE, and uh, I worked for several other freelance work, but it's more, all of them were either with indigenous rights or women's, uh, you know, stopping violence against women, which in the whole subcontinent is a huge thing, you know, in Asia, in South Asia, Um, and part of, in Bangladesh, um, when you're talking about violence, you know, there's the domestic violence that can be one group. And then there's, you know, I specifically looked at garments factory workers and sex workers who, you know, we have brothels everywhere where men are allowed to go, but the sex workers, when they come out, they are treated um, like a non-human basically. They're, they're totally vilified from the society. 
um, brutally abused and all that. So for, I, I remember when you were talking about, you know, as an activist, losing your energy, three and a half years into working with, you know, literally living in brothels and looking at the violence, like as an empath too, mm -hmm. I didn't know, like I sucked up so much of that energy and I just hit a rock bottom, you know, I was like, I, I just cannot do it anymore. And all these nonprofits have this guideline of not getting personal with the subject, whereas I being me myself, I have these people over my house, you know, <laughs> like, so I have been called several times by the CEOs, like, hey, like, you cannot do that. I was like, well, it's just being human, you know, like, I feel for them. And I tried to. So yeah, so um, um, and for listeners, I also want to say that Bangladesh is, you know, most people think Bangladesh is all Bengalis, but we also have our indigenous groups of people, which are the Chakmas, the Marmas, the Garus, there's so many of them, um, different ethnicities, who's, who are mostly in the Chittagong Hill tracks. So when I was growing up, my, you know, I grew up with Chakma people. So for me, it was natural. But when you move to the city, these indigenous people's land are taken over by my you know, like my ethnicity, Bengalis. So yeah. it's the it's it's a cause that not many people know about. And um, Chakmas are actually Tibeto Burman. So I got very involved with uh, the indigenous people's rights and actually went all the way to the UN to the permanent forum on indigenous issues in the headquarter. You know, rallying on their behalf, but as a Bengali. You know, the the ethnicity that took over um, and now basically doing to them what China did to Tibet. Um, so and was it mainly for protecting their land where they live and yeah and yeah. also the you know the forced migration of Bengali settlers there mm -hmm. and you know even in the army uh, to punish you they would as an army officer you would be sent to work in Chittagong Hill Tracks that that's kind of and it's the most peaceful part of the country you yeah. know it's the hills but they're they're there's a lot of violence and fire in the hills. Um, and so, yes, and, you know, there are rapes and all kinds of violence against women in that territory too. So, mm -hmm. um, so yeah, so somehow stopping violence against women was huge for me. Like I just felt very, um, in 2010, I think 2010 or somewhere around that time, we were finally able to pass um, not just myself it's a huge women's community in Bangladesh yes. and we were able to pass the you know some of the hard-hitting laws that exist in the country now uh, where you have all this ways to take someone to court if something like that happens and back then there wasn't anything so I think we have come a long way but there's uh, some of my male friends complain that now women have more rights because uh, they have been given so much um, like if if a divorce is happening, the woman can claim so much more. Uh, we don't have the dowry system. We don't have, you know, so there's a lot that has happened, but there's so much more to go, more ways to go that yeah. we can improve in that. There yeah. and here. Yeah. There and here, honestly. And um, in general, I feel like working with, with youth or children just really gives me energy. Mm -hmm. Like, uh, and I think, um, you know, I love working with children uh, because when I see them, I see where I was at their age and it's whatever we offer to them, they soak it in, right? Like um, the world is so different for them now, but um, nothing makes me happier than like, even if it's an hour long talk with children, it just, I really, that's, kind of you know I just do it out of love and my own selfish reasons to have a joyful time <laughs> are you doing that in LA as well yeah so I, I do a lot of speaking gigs uh, yeah. um, both online and in person and yes so a lot of them are with uh, children and schools and universities too what are you talking to them oh, about? corporate talks are you know, I do that too, but yeah. the more um, the children wants. Well, it depends what age group I talk to. Yeah. Usually using the mountain symbol as 
you know, life struggle. Um, yes. So I usually have, you know, uh, when I'm booked for a talk, I usually see who the audience is and then cater to what, what they would benefit from. Um, it's kind of like mountains are such a great uh, symbol, right? You can pretty much apply it to anyone, anyone, everyone's life. Absolutely. Absolutely. Mother mountains yeah. to att attain in mountains of our own challenges also uh, within us. Inner mountains. Inner mountains, exactly. Um, how do you, do you find when you're talking to the youth that um, there is a lot of struggle with thinking about what the future of our planet is in terms of um, just, you know, all the obvious things of global warming and reduction in biodiversity and <laughs> just everything, you know, people not being able to survive and be able to live in certain areas of the world. Do you feel like that that's very much on their minds? Um, yes and no. Okay. Um, I think it depends also which part of the world I'm speaking yeah. to. Um, I'm in LA, so I get all kinds of really well protected uh, people in the audience to, you know, people who are obli oblivious of anything that's happening outside mm -hmm. this to, um, and, you know, I feel like even when I myself, have, every time I watch myself being in America, it's very easy to get kind of uh, in that bubble and not think about rest of the world. Yeah. Um, and uh, not just with children, but even in adult climate related groups that I've been to or any meetings I've been to, very rarely I've heard any conversation that goes outside America. Mm. But I think that is a major place where we all need to, you know, all earth lovers need to work on is like the conversation has to get outside America. America is not the world. So for example, the trash that we're disposing here is yes. getting dumped somewhere in my country or in other parts of Asia where we don't know how to dispose them. And now Bangladesh, if you see from the satellite, there's a whole methane uh, coming from this area and we, we're we already such a small landmass, right? So, uh, and then eventually how it comes back to through the fishes over here. So till we understand interdependence here, exactly. um, and I feel like all the in youth, and I don't blame the youth because they're being directed by how um, in a lot of the youth conversation, I think it's very America centered. Mm -hmm. It should be like more, global yeah yeah i mean just you know little things that just help them connect for example you know that oh it's great to have electric cars right you know in our country over here sure we can make them more affordable but the batteries require the minerals that have to be mined and they're taken out of the ground in other countries where forests are being taken down for the mining and and uh, all of this is contributing to our um, degradation of the whole environment. It's, I just, I wonder how it feels for you. Do you ever feel, um, you know, in light of the climate activist who just took his own life um, just a few, right. few days ago, that kind of despair, you know, that mm. I can understand um, because of the inact, we're not activating. We're not activating as we need to. And I can see that that despair can be very, uh, have a very negative effect on a lot of people. And right. for a lot of children that I've seen in my daughter's age group, for example, you know, they almost don't want to deal. It's too much. It's yeah. too much. It's too much to even think about, you know. How old is she? She's 20 now. Yeah. 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 Of course so. it is, and I can understand that, you know, like from their perspective, they have to focus on their own education, standing up, but yeah. overwhelming, but there's also not much hope being given. And um, exactly. In terms of uh, the other thing I was going to say is like, there's a lot of solution in, let's say in America that doesn't work for rest of the world, like you were saying about, you know, electric cars or, you know, like, uh, I'm not going to mention the organization, but it's here in LA, but they go all big on going vegan. 
I myself am a vegan, but you can't ask nomads or people who has lived high up in plateaus or natives whose lifelong, you know, uh, activity has been hunting and gathering to go vegan. That's not the solution to the problem, you know. Uh, we can afford to, those who can, but that's not the only solution. So I think as we move forward to really take inspiration from, uh, I don't know, farmers in India or people from the rest of the world, like how do they adapt to it and being open and diversifying and um, I think there is a intersectionality that we don't we are not always mindful of. Um, and, you know, like it, it only benefits us if we take wisdom from so many, you know, different regions, right? Agreed, agreed. I also, there's just so much that's come from being a prosperous country here in America. And our, our nature is to just keep wanting and, and getting more, more and more. The idea of moderating, um, sort of doesn't really exist. It's just how much can we extract all the time. Yeah, well, I would like to ask you to please share with us what is in, in the cards for you in your near future and far future, if you want to think that far. <laughs> well, uh, right now I am working uh, in the development area of two tv projects that i can talk about you the cannot way, talk about okay you know, so it, the way it works is you develop it and then if it sells to networks that's when you can talk sure. about it. So sure, sure. i have that's why one of the reasons why i'm in l.a uh, i'm also working on my memoir uh, which i've taken full freedom um to take all the time that i need and um, my publishers got really kind of frustrated, but then the pandemic hit, but then I realized the pandemic hit and those two and a half years were actually going to be my last chapter. So it was, it's going to come out as uh, when it's supposed to. Um, I'm also planning or not planning, I'm leaving, hopefully waiting for a visa to go on this another big expedition. Um, and we'll see uh, if that one happens. I, I can't mention where it is. But all my all the updates are on my social and on my website. And okay, yeah, great, wonderful. And once, once the memoir comes, that that's when I start working on the children's book, which is more of a graphic novel. Um, so, is it? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Good. So it's a it's a graphic. Like when I was a kid, I remember I was more into visuals than reading. <laughs> My daughter loves graphic novels. She loves them. She draws them. She writes them. She reads them. She loves them. Yeah. And it's based off my life, but it's fictional. So it, so I have to, I had to put in imagination. And it's a little girl's journey with the Yeti, baby Yeti monkey. <laughs> so. Does she have the superpower of peace? Uh, maybe. I'm still working on it. Yeah. <laughs> it's a seven series uh, graphic novel. But my memoir has been sitting on for so long like i want to finish that one and then yes start. So we'll see when that happens very good very good well i wish you all the best and thank you so much for sharing your time with us thank you. and uh, we will let everyone know that they should go to wasvianazreen.com yes. which talks has all your multifaceted interests are um, explored there with your writings you also have a little film which i watched the other day um, yeah god these are so old they are they are so that because everything 15 i think yeah what's that that was made in 2015 mm -hmm. the short film well we've had a pandemic you know right <laughs> <laughs> two years just went somewhere and none of us can find what happened during those two years and now we're just emerging from it Exactly. Will you go back to India anytime soon? I want to, yeah. especially to see His Holiness. Uh, yeah. We'll see. The thing is, I again, for me to be, enter any country, I need visa and all that. So maybe later um, this summer, because now His Holiness is seeing people. Yes. We do have a conference. Uh, can I talk about that? 
Yes. It's called Climate Crisis at Third Pole. It's uh, organized by Tibet House, but you know His Holiness the Dalai Lama is the um, patron of the Tibet House, and so it's kind of a collaboration between scientists, activists, uh, all kinds of policy holders, and then alongside uh, Himalayan and you know the third pole is Himalayas as well as the Karakoram range which is in Pakistan and Afghanistan that mm-hmm. side so we're bringing in activists from there and I'm moderating the second day with mountaineers so it should be epic mm-hmm. October 13th to 16th and it's an online uh, free conference that um would be open by his holiness i believe and every morning there's you know chants and music and um i think from all spiritual traditions i believe yeah but definitely tibetan um, i remember tenzing was mentioning this to us oh yes yeah. is this up on your website anywhere not yet but okay. i'm gonna put it up i need to update my website now that you have like <laughs> drawn all this attention but no um I think we're waiting for some things to finalize, but the yes. date is October 13 to 16. Yeah, so um, I'm with Tenzin on the first day too, but there are several days of, it's it's going to be amazing. Um, there are just, I know who the speakers are and there's a lot of visuals and also to actually see people connected to this region and how their lives are being affected. I think um, one of the reasons, I know you, you're trying to finish up, so I'm just- No, no, it's okay. Thank you. So, when, when I take people, like when I lead expeditions, to see them connect with nature, you know, and a lot of them are actually just like LA corporate folks who's never left their mm-hmm. town or at the most they've been to Mount Shasta and that's it. And then they go and see and they have a real connection with that area, the locals and all that. That's when you can invoke you know, for them to act, right? So I agree. I did that for some years too. Yeah, leading. I took people uh, to uh, in Africa and India to the wildlife reserves, and oh wow, oh yeah. So that was I spent quite a few years doing that actually, and most of them they were they were all Americans because I was living here at the time, and that was the way that I got them interested in saving right. wild tigers, which is my project that I right. like to support in India. So I completely understand what you're saying. Yeah, which is the beauty in this country, actually, because people have the opportunity to go to the national parks and actually really appreciate nature, you know, firsthand. Yeah, Yeah, and I always actually give the example of national parks and how well America has done in terms of maintaining carbon footprint in the national parks. And I give, give the example of this to my Nepali brothers and sisters and you know how Everest area needs to be controlled like that because it's over over that's a whole nother topic but yeah it is we we might have to have a series of conversations <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much thank i'm so you. happy to have had thank you. you so much it's my honor to be able to talk to you and thank you for sharing my story with your platform yeah i hope you'll come to new york and visit with us at tibet house um, maybe, maybe in October I might be there, uh, but if not before then. Uh, okay, sounds great. All right, much love. Thank you so much.